we want to graph this polynomial function. So we'll begin by determining the zeros of this function. So it's worth noting that this particular function is already in factored form. So I'm going to go ahead and underline the factors. We have x here as a factor because it is multiplied by x plus 3 quantity squared. So x plus 3 is our second factor, and then we have an x plus 1 as well as an x minus 2. So these are going to be our factors, and the factor theorem basically is telling us that um, if we have the zeros, then we can figure out the factors. Well, the reverse is also true. If we have the factors, then we also know the zeros. So looking at my very first factor here of just x, setting that equal to zero, we can see that x equals zero is one of the zeros. My next factor here of x minus, excuse me, x plus three uh, will yield a zero of negative three. Third factor of x plus one will give a zero of negative one. And then this last factor of x minus two will give us a zero of positive two. Now, when we think about the degree, though, the degree of the entire polynomial, then we want to pretend as if we were going to expand the entire polynomial. We don't want to actually do that, but if we did expand it, we would take a look at all these powers. We have x to the first power, and then x plus 3 squared, that would yield an x squared, and then we have an x to the first here, as well as an x to the first here. So taking a look at all of those exponents, if you were to expand them, you would see we would have a degree of 5. So the degree of this polynomial is going to be degree 5, which means, fundamental theorem of algebra states, we should have five zeros. And you'll notice right here, we only have four. So we need a fifth zero, and that means we must have a multiplicity in this case. So you'll notice again that the second factor here, the x plus 3, had that quantity squared, and that meant that we have a multiplicity. So this zero of negative 3 has a multiplicity of 2. I often just write mult, a multiplicity of 2. But the fact that it has a multiplicity is going to tell us something about the graph. So remembering that even multiplicities are going to just touch the x-axis and odd multiplicities are going to cross the x-axis, then it's worth noting that we're going to have a, a touch in this case, that our graph is going to just touch the x-axis at x equals negative 3. And that's because we had a multiplicity there. That zero could be counted twice. And if you count it twice, then you have a total of five zeros. Now, other useful points on the graph, in addition to the x-intercepts, would be the y-intercept. So remembering that, finding the y-intercept requires us to set x equal to zero. So if we substitute zero in for x, we'd have something like zero times zero plus three, the quantity squared, times zero plus one times 0 minus 2. And labeling this appropriately, what we're really finding here is h of 0. We're substituting 0 in place of x. But you'll notice in this case, uh, we'll have 0 times basically 3 squared, which would be 9. 0 plus 1 is 1. 0 minus 2 is negative 2. But none of that really matters since we're multiplying by 0. We would get an answer of 0. So our y-intercept is 0. No surprise, really, because the x-intercept, one of the zeros was zero, so that would be our y-intercept as well. All right, and the last thing before we actually go to a graph is to think about the end behavior of this polynomial. So we've already said that it's a degree of five. So odd degrees tell us that the ends of the graph are going to point in opposite directions. But then we also want to take a look at the leading coefficient. And since this is in factored form, we need to take a look at basically all of the coefficients of x. So you'll notice we do have a 1 out in front here, but we also have a 1 in front of my x within this factor, another 1 in front of this x, and another 1 in front of that last x. So we really want to analyze all of those coefficients and imagine that, yes, if you did multiply that out, we would still have a leading coefficient of positive 1. So that tells us for the end behavior that the ends are going to point in opposite directions, but no matter what happens inside this curve, it's going to eventually rise. So again, we could have several peaks and valleys, but we know that the ends point in opposite directions and that the, um, the end result, as we move to the right of the, on the graph, that the end result is that the graph is rising. So now let's put all of this information together and form our graph. 
So you'll notice when we computed all of the zeros, we had five zeros all together. One of them had a multiplicity, but they were all real zeros. So that means we are actually going to see all of those zeros as x-intercepts on our graph. So we had an x-intercept of zero. We have another one of negative three, negative one, and positive two. And then we have the end behavior that the ends were going to point in opposite directions, but the graph was going to eventually rise. So sometimes I'll just sketch in the end behavior like this, and then I'll smooth it out and, and erase and adjust if necessary. And now we just need to pay attention to the behavior of the graph near the x-intercepts. So remembering, we wrote down that at negative 3, the graph was just going to touch the x-axis. So as we come up here, at negative 3, the graph is just going to touch the x-axis and then bounce right off. Then it's going to cross the x-axis at negative 1, it crosses again at 0, and lastly, it crosses at positive 2. So kind of smoothing out my curve, maybe fixing this little piece over here so this looks a little bit better. We would have something like this for my polynomial function h of x. Now, remember, you could always take the curve and, and input it in your graphing calculator and check the graph that your cal calculator creates against our graph here. And there, there may be a couple of discrepancies, so let's just talk about um, some things that we don't know right now. Common questions would be maybe right here, how low should this minimum be or how low should this minimum be here on the left? And we really don't know that. Um, we could go ahead and, and make a table and say we could we could plot um, x equals positive 1 or maybe over here x equals negative 2. We could make a table and find out the corresponding y values and that would give us a better idea of exactly how low the graph goes at those points. Or, with a little bit of calculus knowledge, you will be able to use a concept called a derivative to help you figure out these minimums. But for right now, for our purpose, I'm not too worried about how low those minimums, minimums are, nor how high this, this maximum is. So keep in mind, if your graph looked something like this, maybe you have come up and you touch, and maybe you've gone down lower, or maybe came up higher here, say you have this graph that I have in green, I would still count that as an accurate graph for now because again, all I'm looking for are accurate x-intercepts, the accurate y-intercept, accurate end behavior, and then the accurate behavior at each of these zeros, at each of the x-intercepts. So once again, it's okay if you have somewhat lower minimums here than maybe what we have in the red graph. That's okay for now. Later as we move along, we'll be able to get more accurate um, a more accurate graph in between these intervals.